morning life point crossing. I'm not sure how your morning's starting out, but I just pulled the little fuzzy thing off my mic, and I don't know how much difference that makes. Um, but it's probably there for some sort of reason. I think probably it keeps it less breathy for you. So that's back, and that's doing, doing well. well. Welcome, you guys. I'm so glad that you're here today. I hope that you are going to be glad you're here today. And if you haven't already been clued in, now for sure you have, that you just showed up at church on a time when we're talking about money. And we do that for a lot of very, very good, I think, and very important reasons. But uh, I know that it's a lot, it, it can be really difficult for people. And so normally... This is the part of the message where if you've been here for a, a good part of the last year, you know I would probably try and say something to bring down your defenses. I might even ask, just say, listen, you guys, just, it's okay, just, just, just bring them down. We're going to be all right. Uh, today, I'm not going to do that uh, because um, I don't know if this is going to be the hardest message that you've heard from me in the last year, but it might be the most direct. And so the next time that I tell you that it's okay, you can bring down your defenses, I want you to believe me and say, well, he, he is honest with us. So today, I think that it, it might be that Jesus really is coming for some of your hearts. And so if you feel like bringing up the defenses is the appropriate thing for, for you to do, this might be the time to do that. And it's, it's interesting to me that a lot of times, if you talk about something, there are a couple different topics that sometimes really kind of strike very close to people's hearts that you deal with from time to time. And sometimes people then will push back on those. And most of the time when that happens, it's really coming from a place that it seems like it's mostly from emotion. And it's not necessarily coming from like a theological framework or, you know, Ross, I, I feel like maybe you misunderstood this passage or misinterpreted, you know, something here. Um, but it just seems like it's coming from, oh, you know what, this, this really struck close to me and, and so I'm pushing back on this. But with money, actually, it's a little bit different because the most common or maybe the quickest thing that people will push back on with money is really true. Maybe some of you have thought things like this. Maybe you're thinking this right now with your defenses up. You hear things like this, like, you know what? God doesn't need my money. It's true. It's actually really very quite correct. You could quibble a little bit with the my money part. Again, if you were here last week, we talked about it's really not your money. It's all God's money, and we just have control over it for a little while on, on this earth, but basically it really is true. Even if it wasn't all God's, what would God need money for? What's he going to buy, chicken wings? He created chickens. Does he need an oil change? God's omnipresent. Transportation is not a, a line item on his budget. God doesn't need your money. Now, the church does. Church and ministry, just like everything in the world, of course do require money in order to function, and that gives us a great opportunity to be a part of what God does and invest for eternity at the same time. But it's basically effectively true. God doesn't need your money. In fact, some of you might have even heard the kind of uh, extended version, the, the uncut version of God doesn't need my money, which is, you know what, God, he doesn't even want your money. What he wants is the place in your heart that money has. And what's interesting is that's generally also even, you know, for, at least for the most part, also true. And so some of you are like, what is all this about defenses? This is the most glorious truth I have ever heard a pastor utter. And so what that has done now is that you feel like this is now giving you full permission to lie to yourself and say that, yes, of course God has my heart, so I will keep my money. And now, pastor, you can go ahead, sit down, and we'll be done with this. Well, here's why that's not going to happen today is because I don't think God really has your heart. And I think Jesus says. So we're going to be going to some things that Jesus talks about here. Uh, in, and we're skipping kind of to the end of a longer speech about money and giving and possessions. It's recorded for us in Luke chapter 12. We're going to be starting at verse 33. And here's where we're starting. He says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. What? We just said God doesn't need my money. So do I have to go back and explain this to Jesus too? Like what, why, why would he say this? Why would he say this? Well, actually, you may think there's a clue here, but if we keep listening, here's what he says next. He answers that. He says, this will store up treasure for you in heaven. And then 
he begins to explain the benefits of storing treasures in heaven. And he says, the persons of heaven, they, they never get old or develop holes. Your treasure is going to be safe in heaven in ways that it's not safe here on earth. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Jesus isn't just telling you what to do. He's also telling you why. And this is so interesting to me that this is framed not even in terms of, of give because there are you know, people who have needs and we care about them. For sure, Jesus and Scripture are clear in many, many places that we are to be concerned with the poor, and that's, that's something that we want to be a part of. But this is framed, you can see it. Really, like this is, is actually for you. He, he explains how this is in your best interest. Not only is heaven literally eternal, as opposed to just the couple of handful of decades that we're likely to have here on earth, but along with that, your treasure there is safe in ways that it's not safe here. In investment terms, this is Jesus saying, listen, this is all reward and no risk. This is all profit and no exposure. And what's interesting is this isn't something that's really new or hasn't ever been heard or talked about. This has been read and written and preached on and discussed for 2,000 years now. It's a relatively well-known passage here, right? If you spend a lot of time studying scripture or in church, you've probably come across it maybe multiple times. This isn't some breakthrough in wealth management or some new investment strategy that some influencer has put up on a TikTok. So what's really interesting about this then, what's really strange is why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? Or at least in, in, not even necessarily in terms of you know, selling everything and giving to the poor, but just giving generally. Why don't we do it? Or why don't we do it more? Because I don't know, of course, generally most anybody in here exactly what you do or don't give, but for most people, and even most people in church, right, I read surveys and, you know, things that tell you about really the, the average amount of an income that a person even in church gives is really relatively low. And so I know there are generous people here, and if this isn't you, then this isn't you, but for most of us, really we give Really not very much. Isn't that true? Even, even my own household, we certainly we return 10% to the church, and then there are some other things that we do along with that, but it's, it's not really extraordinary. I mean, we're not giving 60% or 70% or certainly anything like that. And so here's something that's interesting, I think, is this happens where if you talk to a financial advisor or you hear somebody on the radio and they're talking about investing for your future and they might say, you know what, well really the good rule of thumb is you want to be putting away 15% of your income to have the, the future that you want to have. And we hear that, we're like, that is a lot. Some of you actually, maybe you just heard that for the first time and this is the only thing you're going to remember from the message is, oh my goodness, we are way behind. We're supposed to be putting up, uh, away 15%. But you think, okay, well that's, that's really a lot. But all right, let's see what we can do, and we'll go home and we'll look at the budget, and maybe not right away, but maybe after a few months or a couple of years, we'll be able to get there and, and have this 15% put away so that we can have the future that we want. But then when the idea of the tithe or 10% to God for your eternity comes up, it's, whoa, 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 pastor. God doesn't need my money. So that's strange, isn't it? And so just honest question, which I think Jesus is actually about to answer, so you don't feel too bad about answering it to yourself, but why, why is that? Why, why, why do you think that is? I think Jesus points us to the answer. Here's the next sentence. He says, he says wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. I, I think what he's saying which is a little bit hard to, to argue with, is just on sort of a very basic level, is the reason why it's hard for us, the reason why we, or the, well, the reason why we don't do it is very simply because we don't want to do it on a basic level, right? If you hear me say the phrase, listen, treasures in heaven, what do you think of when I say that? Here's my guess for most of us, is you think, well, that sounds nice. Is that probably pretty close? If I ask you how much you value that, I think really honestly, probably for most of us, the answer is, well, not really 
that much. And I think part of what Jesus is saying here, which is, this is so helpful, is, is he, like, he's not like mad at you about it. It's not that. But he's saying, no, the, the reason is it's not, you know, because you don't love God or enough or something. It's simply that you don't value eternity because you haven't invested in eternity. This is so clear, but this is so tricky, and we tend to get this exactly backwards. Is here's what I think so often happens, is we, we feel like we want to wait until we want to give, like just for our heart to change to where we're going to want to give, and then once we want to, well, then of course we're going to do it, right? Because then we want to, but until that happens, then you know, we'll just kind of keep doing what we're doing. And I think what Jesus is indicating here is that that strategy will get you absolutely nowhere. However, your heart can move. And in fact, you can move it. Here's, I think, part of what he's saying, is we have a, a Ken message here today a little bit, is that your heart and your money, short version, these are connected, right? And that wherever you want your heart to go, you can move it. Right? You know, it'll slide better like this. Wherever you put your treasure, your heart will pull in that direction. Right? Your, your heart will move. The way I would say it for a message like this is that the desires of your heart, your heart, right? Your desires will follow your deposits. And so if you want to press play on what Jesus says and begin investing toward where you know it will have the greatest and longest value. It says, well, well, you know, you can do that. You just start making some deposits, and your heart will follow wherever you send it. Now listen, honestly, take down your defenses for just at least a couple minutes here, all right? You can, you can listen to this just for, I just think this is interesting, honestly. Uh, I just think human beings and human nature are very interesting. But I, I think it's very interesting the way that the desires of our heart, the things we value, the things we treasure, they're on one level, they're tremendously random. But I think from a different perspective, they're also very, very predictable. Okay? And here's a little bit what I mean, is really treasure or value is largely relative. A lot of us in here, we all value or treasure different things. Some of this is obvious on a large scale. If you think about a person who lives in an untouched interior tribe in South America, they are not going to value a coach purse or high-end athletic shoes or the CDs that I was buying for God's CD collection last week. Uh, those are very interesting shiny discs, but they don't care. A dollar store hammer, though, might be the most valuable thing he has ever experienced or come across, right? Even in our society, where we all live in a shared society, a lot of our values are tremendously different and very relative. This is kind of the way, like our entire economy is based on this, right? If I buy a sandwich, it's because I'm valuing that sandwich as, as high or higher than the money that I'm exchanging for it. The sandwich shop is valuing my money more than the sandwich that they're exchanging for it. And so the reason that we make the exchange is because we both feel like we're, we're getting good value and adding value from the transaction. That's what our, our entire economy is based out of. Now, there is a of course, such a thing as intrinsic value. Your house, for instance, as a shelter, has some level of intrinsic value in ways that some other things don't. If you think, for instance, of like collectible stamps, that's, that's really, that only has value because somebody values it, right? But here is a one cent stamp, or a picture, of course, of a one cent stamp that a few years ago, this sold for over nine million dollars. So would you trade your house for a stamp? It turns out the answer is maybe. It depends on the house and it depends on the stamp. I will admit readily that my house is valued at somewhere under $9 million. Perhaps yours is as well. But that's not the point. The point is that different people develop shockingly different values. And it's really kind of random, right? I mean, a one cent stamp for $9 million? But it's also kind of predictable. Because here's what I can say with tremendous confidence about the person who traded over $9 million for this stamp, is they knew a lot about stamps. Let me say that in a different way. 
they had invested boatloads of time and energy in effort for years, probably decades, plural, in learning about stamps. I would also bet that this was not the first stamp they'd purchased. I'll bet this was just being added to an already large and impressive collection of stamps, which is really another way of saying they had already invested a great deal of money in their collection of stamps. And probably just randomly throughout the day, I'll bet that this is a person who thought quite a bit about stamps. These are really just additional deposits or additional investments, right? And so this item that has zero intrinsic value whatsoever, probably none of us, unless you happen to be really into stamps, would have any interest in this. Well, somebody else did. Why? Because of their prior investments. This is really just as bizarre, but is going to sound less bizarre to most of us, who at least who aren't into stamps. This won't be all of us, but a lot of us, including myself, have you ever thought, and, and probably some of us even have, how bizarre it is that we care about sports. I will tell you to people like my wife who don't pay any attention to sports, it is every bit as bizarre as a $9 million for a one-cent stamp. It doesn't make any sense. But how it happens is really Pretty predictable, isn't it? If this was you, and for sure this was me, it's probably when you were young, or at least sometime, obviously, when you were younger in, in your past. Well, it started with you were exposed to it. Probably it was on TV or the radio. Maybe your parents watched and, and paid attention, and it was on billboards. It was The kids talked about it on the bus and, and on the playground at school. It was a part of the news, right? So you, you, you were exposed to this. You became aware of this, and then... After time, you began to listen carefully to this phrase, pay attention. And then particularly, if you maybe grew up in or around Kansas City or some other city that has a home team, right, your exposure and your deposits of attention grew until you became emotionally invested, right? You, you started to, to care about the team with Whichever color jersey, probably red, if you are you know grew up in Kansas City. Although that's interesting because we all know this and we all understand this also, don't we? Is that something as random as geography can completely be predictive of how this works. Because most of the people who you know here cheer for the Chiefs, but Laura and I a year ago moved from New Hampshire, and guess what? Pretty much nobody there cheers for the Chiefs. They all cheer for Boston teams, despite the fact that we all agree that we hate the city of Boston. But, but they all cheer for Boston teams. And then sometimes, not all the time, right? So I would never do this, but we know this happens sometimes is even if a person just changes their geography and moves from one city or one part of a country to another, then eventually over time, they start to care less and less about the team with the colored jersey that they used to care so much about all their life. And they start to care more about the one that they're around now because the, they're exposed more and they begin to pay attention and those deposits begin to, to change their heart and their heart begins to follow their deposits. Deposits, right? Your desires follow your deposits. And so this is amazing news that Jesus understood how this works and he tells us how to leverage it for your good and in fact your eternal good. Because you all know that your heart left to itself, it can go all sorts of crazy places, most of which aren't good. It's absolutely not to be trusted. At some point we'll probably have a whole series on that. However, you do have the ability and the power to control where it goes, right? All you have to do is make some deposits. You want it, you want it to come over here? Send, send some deposits over here. Here it goes. You want it to come back here? Send some deposits wherever you want to target it, wherever, whatever direction you want it to go in, and your desires will follow your deposits just as surely as water runs downhill. So this is where you start. What do you want to care about? Do you want to care about stamps? There's a well-worn path that, that you can go down that will lead you to a place where even if you never have $9 million of disposable income, and by the way, if you do, that's amazing, but, but you might say, you know, I, I don't know that I would pay $9 million for that one-cent stamp but that really would be pretty cool. 
Or maybe, and this is much less foreign, this is not foreign at all, I have thoughts exactly like this. If you're watching a game, and maybe like a championship game, and you see some of the people that are in the best seats, do you ever think, you know, I, like if I had the disposable income to sit in that seat, I, I don't know that I would necessarily use it for that, but you know what, R very truly, oh, that would be an amazing thing to be in, in that particular seat for this uh, particular moment. Well, you just keep making deposits, and that's where your desires will go. Okay, but if you want to value what Jesus values, if you want to value what's valuable, right, he says you can store up your treasure where it's safe, where it doesn't depreciate or corrode, where it's there, where it's good for eternity. Yeah, rather than just the few decades that we happen to be here, which this is, you know, this, this is all going away. And so you know this makes sense, right? You can disagree with Jesus. You can tell him he's wrong if you think that you're a better authority on eternity and heaven than he is. You can just say, no, I don't, I don't think that's right. But you know this makes sense, okay? You just don't want to do it because your heart's desire isn't there right now. It's because you haven't been making deposits. And that's why we talk about things like this. Even though God doesn't need your money and the church isn't facing a particular financial crisis, although for sure he does use our giving for ministry and for God's glory, is because it's, it's really also for you. Giving is really for you. And when you give to the right things, you're leveraging this incredibly powerful principle that your heart will go where your desires, excuse me, your heart will go where your deposits lead it. So why don't I love God more? I mean, why don't I care more about the people in our community who are apart from Jesus or maybe just, you know, lacking resources, uh, which... By the way, this week, earlier this week, I, may, I had took the gloves that you all donated and collected for people who are homeless, and I took them down into the city to the Neighbor to Neighbor uh, charity, which is going to be distributing them, and just being around that environment and being around those people for uh, just a very few minutes, you know what? You'll, your heart sort of starts to get tugged in a particular direction, right? This is just how this works. Why, why don't I care more about world missions and the billion people on the planet who have never heard the name Jesus and don't have access to a local church? Why, why doesn't my heart go where sometimes I feel like I really know th that it should? Why is this so hard? It's because wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So wherever you want your heart to go, you make some deposits. God doesn't need your money, okay? but he does want your heart. And so it's so easy to say, all right, well, you know what? I know God has my heart, so good. That's done. I'll just take my money and keep that. It's the very definition of talk is cheap. And Jesus seems to indicate that if he doesn't have your money, he may not have your heart either. And so, to conclude, let me just say this. Listen, I know this is striking very close to people's hearts, right? And, and I know that when our hearts feel attacked, they get defensive, they, they strike out, and want to do all sorts of things, okay? And so, you know we exist on the generosity of God's people, and certainly we accept and, in fact, encourage donations. Of course we do. But here's what we don't do, is we don't exist for you to give money to. We exist to see people move forward. To, to take steps in finding and following Jesus and becoming the people that he's created them to be and living the lives that he has for them. And so if you're here, I know, and may you think, okay, on one level, I can't argue with anything that Jesus says. It really does seem clear. It really does seem true. But your heart's saying, but you know what? I am not going to give to the church and the pastor that seems so self-serving that they're going to have a, a series talking about money and giving. I'm not going to do that. Listen, let me just remove that excuse from you and say, all right, don't. 
Here's, I, I think I've shown this before, but here's some, some wonderful organizations to give to where we won't see a penny. Never Thirst gives uh, fresh water, clean water, and the message of Jesus to people who have neither. A Christian Alliance for Orphans is exactly what it sounds like. Compassion and World Help are child sponsorship programs that lift children out of poverty in impoverished parts of the world in the name of Jesus. These are all good, known, reputable uh, organizations uh, who meet people's physical and spiritual needs. Make some deposits. Where do you want your heart to go? Where is the best place? Where is the place that you're going to be happiest with at the end of the day? Because again, this is all going away. This is all going away. Where are you going to want your heart to be? Where is the best place for you Make some deposits, and your heart will follow along. Father, let's pray. Or let's, Father, thank you that Jesus tells us the hard truths and gives us the keys to understanding who we are, how he's created us to work. Thank you that all it takes from us is just the simple allocation of the resources that you've entrusted us with. And that we can take those and, and not only contribute to ministry, but that it's for us, that, that it's for our growth, that it's for our health, that it's for our eternal investment. Listen, still praying, if you're here today, and if this is a message that turns somebody's heart to Jesus just by listening to it, then we know that that is a work of God and his spirit. But I believe in the work of God and his spirit. And so if you're here, you're watching online, wherever you are, listen, the, the message of Jesus is so simple. It's that every one of us is sinners. None of us are, are good enough. We've all done things that were wrong. We did them anyway. That sin, that destroys any possibility that we can have with a whole healthy relationship with the creator God who is perfectly righteous and perfectly just. He can't just look the other way on wrongdoing and pretend it doesn't exist. That would be a terrible, unjust judge. But that's why Jesus came and died and was resurrected so that he lives the perfect righteous life so that he absorbs justice for our sin and our wrongdoing so that he takes our sinfulness, we take his righteousness, and we are adopted as children in God's family, forgiven as his children. And listen, if, if you want that to be you, just right now, right where you sit here at home, just pray and say to God, even silently, and he'll hear you. Pray, God, I believe that Jesus came and died and was resurrected so I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Adopt me and forgive me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. Just pray to prayer like that. It's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's that you put your faith in Jesus. God's grace comes to you through that. You are forgiven and adopted in a new spiritual creation. Listen, the best thing you can do is to, to not try and walk this life by yourself. Go ahead, if you're here after we're done, go out to the point in the lobby and let them know the decision that you've made. Or if you're online, send an email. Let us help give you some good, helpful, healthy steps to be walking down the life that God has for you. We're so excited about what God's doing in the lives of so many people here through this ministry. And for the rest of us, oh, this is a hard message if you haven't been doing it, isn't it? I know it is. Here's the real straight truth, is the more your heart responds with defensiveness, the more that means that we need to be giving. The more that means that God does not, in fact, have our heart. And this is the way our heart moves, is through our deposits. Will you make the decision, right, right as you sit here, to follow God, to begin to, I don't, I don't, not going to be about how much you start with or where you start or, or how much you add to wherever you are, but will you take that step just between you and the Spirit of God to commit to that? And Father, we, we thank you so much for your Spirit that's active and at work in so many of us. I'm so thankful that changing hearts is not my job because we all know that I can't do it. 
but we ask that you would give each one of us the courage and the follow-through to press play on the decisions that we're making. And and Father, in fact, I ask in particular for a message like this, that your spirit would remain active and nipping at our hearts as we go away from this, however we feel in the moment. You would bring each one of us to the place where we are able to make the deposits with joy and with thanksgiving for your glory and for our own eternity with the finances that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.